Hello, I'm David Stewart. Uh, I'm a manager at Intel, and I'm here to talk to you about supply chain armoring, which uh, has been a pretty uh, hot topic in terms of supply chain at this conference. And I hope I have some things which are going to be useful and helpful for you in dealing with this area. I think it's important uh, that I talk about the perspective I'm from and, and the, you know, how do I approach this issue? The whole idea of uh, supply chain is, is really pretty close to me because my experience, I've been in the industry for decades and, and almost all of it um, is, is creating software products or uh, open source projects that, that uh, I, I treat like products in the same sort of care um, sometimes it's working on other people's products. Almost all of these, uh, all of this work has been in the area of system software or uh, you know operating systems compilers, that sort of thing. I've also done work in client uh, applications and in uh, a variety of other different areas. And really full-time uh, work in open source started in 2007. So uh, a lot of focus in that area in, the, in those years. And then uh, since 2018, my full-time focus has been on the area of security. So uh, I get to not only have the great experience of working on terrific uh, products and projects, some of which are, are still even really popular today, which is a huge privilege, I think. But it also gives me the chance to now, as a, as a security person, talk about you know, how we can make these uh, more secure. So that, that's, that's the uh, perspective I come from. And when we talk about uh, the whole solar winds exploit, what happened uh, in my journey here is that uh, it was, you know, this came out public in December and over the holidays, uh, 2020, 2021, I got uh, sort of interested in this because I would read the non-technical press like the New York Times while it was on holiday. And they would start describing the solar winds uh, incident and how it was exploited and why do they call this a supply chain issue, and uh, when I would talk to various uh, security experts around, they would say, well, yeah, this is this probably is has been exploited a bunch of other times as well. So suddenly I was like, well, if, if uh, somebody like myself can read this in the non-technical press, I think we're going to get a lot of questions in the whole software world about, hey, are we vulnerable to the same sort of thing? Is there anything that you're doing to try and um, address this. And so I got, uh, took action, you know, really when I came back to work in January of 2021 to say, let's um, put some things in place immediately, so take some actions across the, the entirety of our software world. And then um, in May of this year, we had some, uh, some actions which came out, which I started to address as well. So that's the perspective I, uh, I come from and um, trying to, uh, really look at trying to take all of this, this area much more seriously. So uh, why this is such an urgent issue, I don't want to um, necessarily go through a bunch of details about the SolarWinds uh, exploit. I'll touch on it a little bit uh, and give it kind of as a, an example why we need to take this whole issue very urgently. Uh, and uh, some of the folks that I collaborate with have uh, uh, really helped me um, be more of it, exposed to, to some of the challenges that we have. And then I'm going to give you some specific tools to use. Uh, I'm going to give you an analysis tool to uh, use to analyze your, uh, your supply chain. And I'm going to help you understand uh, where you need to uh, you know, apply a couple of other uh, open source tools that I have for you. So um, this is uh, what we're going to uh, talk about in, uh, the rest of the, the hour. Uh, so my assertion here, this really is a, a significant issue. And um, one of the things, uh, as I said, we, I, I started getting involved with this uh, early on. Um, and part of the conversation I've been having is with various uh, collections of, uh, whether it's, it's uh, companies or developers or other uh, folks from different or, uh, organizations, nonprofits, et cetera. Um, so we've been doing a lot of collaboration on this whole issue. and. Uh, um, the, the realization is that uh, there's a lot of uh, concern about open source within a lot of, of these organizations um, because they sort of feel like, well, um, how do we know that this was developed in a secure manner? Now, I argue with these folks, look, open source is often um, a way to get actually more secure uh, code than in a closed source or proprietary sort of environment. 
for the uh, exact reason that you potentially have a lot of people looking at the source and can find security issues, can find and fix these things, whereas with proprietary products, while you may only have a very small uh, group of people looking at it, and, and in fact, this is you know, well known as, as the um, you know, best way to get good, good cryptography software is get the algorithms and the code out there where people will look at it at least a year in the public before you actually use you know, any kind of protocol in the, in the crypto space. So, so uh, even though the potential is there for uh, better uh, security and open source software, the reality is a lot of people, because of the behaviors they use, their consumption of open source software is actually uh, kind of uh, leading us to more problems. Uh, and that's where this perception comes from. So I think that the open source community really needs to take this uh, seriously. Um, one of the uh, subject lines uh, I looked at here was, uh, a study that um, had shown that like something like of, of, of all software being created these days, something like 70 to 90 percent is, is from an open source you know, you know, repository of some sort. It had its origin in open source. And uh, so this, this makes it something that uh, I think we really do need to take uh, very seriously. I'm kind of quoting myself here. Uh, I'm actually paraphrasing another uh, longtime security expert who had a slightly different statement, but, I, but in terms of uh, attribution, I'm gonna attribute this quote to myself. And let me tell you where I come from this. I mean, I, as I said, my history is that I've uh, created a lot of software teams. You know, I'll, I'll set up a new team or, um, you know, as we're gonna create a, a new project of some sort, and you assign roles and you, you bring in people to the team to work on various things. and uh, I will fully confess to you that, that I don't necessarily always put the most senior person in the role of the build engineer. Um, now, it's, it's quite often that you will have a senior and very experienced person maybe architect the build system, but actually implementing it and maintaining it is, is uh, I've, I've been just as guilty as I think of folks in, in the rest of the, um, the whole software world of saying uh, not necessarily, the build engineer is not necessarily the most senior person on the team. And so uh, we've created this whole area of vulnerability and what has really uh, uh, happened is that the SolarWinds incident has shown us how easy it is to exploit this very weak area um, in, in the whole way that we, we provide software for folks. So um, I, I often say for my sins, I now have to go correct a lot of the problems that I, I may have created earlier in my career. But this is uh, why we need to take this very seriously and in fact, of course, uh, the, 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 the details of the particular SolarWinds exploit was one in which um, the build server was exploited and some extra software was slipped in into, the, into updates that went into a bunch of uh, government servers and other uh, companies and uh, allowed foreign actors to be able to, uh, you know, do uh, a lot of surveillance and espionage, all by exploiting the build. And uh, our friends over in U.S. government uh, are, are taking action as well. Um, to their credit, they say, hey, we can't go and insist that everybody doing software do it the right way. Uh, but what we can do, the, the one lever they have is, is to control the software that the government buys. And so they've put out this, what's called an executive order, which basically means it's something that was signed by the president to, to order uh, over the next uh, you know, 12 months to put in place uh, work, uh, particularly in this case regarding critical software. And so this is one of the things, uh, if you have critical software that's gonna have a lot of privilege uh, on the system, you definitely wanna make sure it was developed in a way that um, doesn't expose you know, uh, all these secrets. So this is something which um, is, is a, a present um, you know, factor. And I think it really uh, helps focus a lot of our efforts. Uh, again, I think it's everybody's responsibility whether you're, you're going to be affected by this thing or not because guaranteed this is not just the United States government. I think world governments are all going to look at this initiative to, to try and improve things. And as I said, the time frame, the timeline that we're looking at is, is uh, it's not instantaneous, but, but they gave themselves uh, essentially 12 months uh, from May of 21 to May of 22 to identify what all the, the bits of uh, critical software are, what are all the standards that you need to follow in order to um, provide this critical software to the government. And uh, they basically concluded that anything that's gonna get affected by all of these orders 
are things that they would define as, as critical under the uh, focus of the executive order, which means, and this is a partial list, and you would say, ah, oh, security software. Well, that makes sense. But then you have operating systems. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, for an open source operating system like, for example, Linux, uh, if you have all those sources available, you wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, you know, have any problems. But if you're uh, buying an operating system from an operating system vendor and, and you know, uh, getting it delivered as a set of packages or something like that, then, uh, then, then you need, do need to be concerned about it. Uh, in particular, in the non-open source space, I think there's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of concerns of people providing binary components into operating systems like drivers. And maybe this argues everybody should be using an open source operating system. But the reality is um, there's a lot of, of impact there. Web browsers, uh, why? It's because web browsers have uh, password managers, typically. So um, security software, well, that's, that's kind of logical network control software, anything that's monitoring or, uh, you know, or, or managing networks or managing systems, right? Anything that has a, a high level of privilege. Now, what's interesting to me about this 12-month uh, exercise is um, they didn't include firmware as uh, critical software, which I think is kind of interesting because it says, uh, well, you know, do we really think that firmware uh, – doesn't have a lot of privilege, of course. Usually firmware, whether it's BIOS or microcode or uh, little bits and uh, bobs of, of stuff that's that's running on various chips in, in modern systems, while they typically have very uh, high level of privilege and you know ought to be considered uh, critical as well. Um, but from the standpoint of at least the immediate exercise, um, that's uh, we can take a little bit of a pass there. But uh, what I want to tell you is, if you are involved in that area, as far as as uh, you know creating uh, firmware uh, in that space, that will be affected by this order uh, um, probably beyond the first 12 months. So something to pay attention to as well. And what, you know, what do you need to do as a, if you've got critical software that you're supplying? Um, uh, and there's a list of things. They're, they're, they're kind of vague, but one of these that I, I highlighted here, administratively separate builds, is something that's uh, – well, what does that mean? I, when I read that, I was like, well, it could mean everything from, uh, you know, you, you put some controls on a, on a specific build server, or maybe you have to have a completely isolated build server that has no ability to connect with the, uh, the network at all uh, whatsoever when it's doing a build. Um, there are some uh, environments that are like that, uh, particularly in the payment card industry um, and in ultra, you know, secure, sensitive uh, kinds of development. They will do things like a, a completely secure build, but I think trying to get to that point uh, in the bulk of the software industry is going to be uh, pretty challenging. But I think there's a, uh, and this build area, like I said, has been something that's been very interesting to me, so it's been more of a, a kind of a, a focus that I've had to try and understand. What are the tools that we have from the open source space to help with this? Now, I understand that this kind of topic will often make people uh, a bit grumpy. Um, one of the, the uh, leaders in our uh, company has, has uh, opined that uh, software people tend to be uh, lazy and they tend to be religious, uh, which I would heartily agree with that, <laughs> with what is his observation there. Because I think if you've got something that's working, um, you don't want to mess with it. And particularly if you've got a fairly complex build system that maybe you've been tweaking the performance of so you get it to, you know, you can rebuild your, your massive millions of lines of code within an hour or so. This is awesome. Uh, and maybe you've also created a big uh, problem for yourself as well. So I'm hoping that actually uh, you won't be uh, uh, as grumpy uh, about this, but that we can actually uh, uh, hopefully deal with some of the grumpiness that build uh, experts have to think about in this space. So the first set of uh, things that I think to, to seriously address this, this topic is to uh, do some analysis, to use an analytic model. I'm a big fan of, of, of taking a methodology and applying it sort of uh, rigorously and, and convincing yourself and others that you've done a proper job and you know, helping explore, hey, what else do I need to, to go and address? So I think an anal uh, analytic approach to this, I think, is a good one. So uh, the methodology that a lot of 
security people use, very common practice uh, in the, uh, the industry today is to develop and use what's called a threat model. And uh, if, you, if you go, well, I, I don't know how to address security, potential security concerns. How do I address the right ones? Well, a threat model is a great way of doing it. And at a very high level, um, these are the steps for a threat model. Uh, and this is super high level. But, uh, what, what you try and do is understand your architecture, write it down. Can you draw, draw a picture? What, what uh, we often uh, call the gazintas and the gazautas. Uh, what's going in and out of every box in, in your whatever you're analyzing, and in this case, you know, your build system. Uh, you want to identify the assets, and the assets, this, these are the things which are really uh, important to you to protect. And uh, so, for example, your source code and, and binaries, signed binaries, et cetera, these are typically assets. Um, maybe not every .o or, or um, intermediate uh, you know, build product that would necessarily be an asset. So uh, identify those assets uh, and their interfaces. Try and then identify the next step is to identify who are the attackers that you want to be aware of. Not every attack and attacker is um, as important as every other one. So you can be, uh, it's important to understand that these need to be prioritized and uh, think rationally. It's like, okay, it's possible someone might want to do this and could. Uh, how likely is it? How hard is it? So that's part of the idea of using judgment to prioritize these things. And then go uh, figure out what mitigations are. Maybe they're 100% mitigation. Maybe they're only a partial mitigation. Uh, but then prioritize them and go uh, do, uh, implement them. So this is the whole idea of creating a threat model. So how do you start? There's actually a, a great paper that I'll put the link to uh, uh, and, and make it available to you. Uh, and that's a, a software supply chain threat model uh, by a couple of my associates at Intel. And uh, they have a number of different um, charts like this where they basically said, hey, here are the um, major steps. And this, this is an example of one that I pulled out that's a, a, you know, looks like a, a sort of a hybrid between a waterfall and some sort of a continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment sort of model. And so as you can see, this is a, uh, um, you know, these are the various steps. And so you could use something like this to analyze and understand where are all the potential attack points of something like this. And that's exactly what these uh, experts did. And I think this is a, uh, an example of a very exhaustive list of potential attacks. So if you're Struggling with trying to figure out, well, what are the potential attacks, you know, that could happen uh, in my build system? Well, this is a pretty darn exhaustive list. Now, not every one of these is as important as the other ones. You could look at, you know, at the concept level, right? Somebody, you could have an insider that could somehow mess with the concept and insert, you know, something bad there. I, I mean, it's possible, and from an intellectual standpoint, I suppose you could say, oh, yeah, it's, it's possible, so write it down. Um, but it's a, a probably pretty unlikely. You know, if someone's going to exploit something, it's much easier maybe to uh, exploit, uh, you know, something in your, your actual build system in terms of injection of malicious code, compromising build tools, et cetera. So um, this is uh, probably more likely the kinds of things you want to protect against. Uh, again, it gives you a, 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 a sort of a some ideas of the kinds of things that are possible um, that you could be attacked by. And, you know, although this is a really complete list, I think these guys have done a phenomenal job. I think the, it, it can be a little bit daunting to see all of these uh, in, in, in front of you. I want to give an alternative model, which also is, is really helpful that, that you can use. And this is a, something you might have heard of called Salsa, or Supply Chain for Software Artifacts. It's an open source project that was started initially uh, by Google, uh, although today there's a, a good uh, collaboration between various uh, different uh, you know, developers from different organizations. And so um, I think this is really pretty uh, exciting stuff uh, because you can look at this and you say, okay, this is exactly how my brain thinks in terms of maybe, maybe this model works really well for you of thinking about how do I map what I'm doing against this? So let's take a look. What you can see is that they have mapped out uh, what are the assets. They've uh, looked at how the gazintas and gazautas of the various phases of the build process uh, happen. And they've identified 
the places where you could have potential attacks. And uh, it, it may not be 100% um, complete. It is at least a, a, a set of, of reasonable things to go uh, analyze and, and prioritize. And so you look at A through H and you can say, okay, these are all attack, uh, potential attack areas that I can go do mitigations on if, I'm, you know, if I care to. So I really like this, uh, this way of, of doing things and, and of thinking about uh, supply chain security. Uh, by the way, there's another thing that Salsa uh, has that I think is, is very powerful. And that's this whole idea of, of levels. And so if you, uh, if you think, well, I can't, I mean, how do I get started? Um, what's, is there a first step that I can get to? And, and this is very nice too from that standpoint because you can say, oh, I can, I, Salsa has different levels. And the font size may be too small for you to see, but I would uh, comment on the fact that at least in Salsa level one, if you have uh, a scripted build, right? You're not just you know, typing uh, make, but you actually have all the steps you know, automated in a script and you have uh, the provenance of your components established. And provenance in this case means uh, you, you, you know, maybe you have uh, um, various different versions of software from uh, you know, NPM or various you know, Git projects or various uh, PyPI or what have you, or maybe you have you know, some code that you lifted out of uh, um, something on Stack Overflow or something like that. Well, if you have all the provenance available for all the components that goes in, um, you, uh, that in a scripted build so gets you to level one of salsa. It's pretty good. Um, and, and more things get uh, layered on at different levels. At salsa level four, um, uh, we have a lot of really terrific uh, things here, where, like the source, you have two, at least two people are reviewing every change. Um, it can be a little bit challenging to, to achieve that, and it's not perfect, right? There's still possible for um, people to miss stuff in a, in a, in a source code uh, review. Um, there's some studies uh, uh, based on that, but it's it's a darn good practice and in, in, in terms of uh, trying to identify things. Um, uh, uh, in the build area, we talk about hermetic builds. This is a, a concept that says, again, this is this this comes out of a requirement from the uh, payment card industry uh, that all of the builds that you do on the software have to be on systems that are completely uh, disconnected from the network, that all the resources for the build, dependencies, source, et cetera, are all locally available. Um, and uh, some, uh, some projects out there, if you search for hermetic, hermetic builds, you can find some ways of applying that. Uh, reproducible builds um, tend to be uh, uh, kind of hard uh, to accomplish. This is the reason why they say it's required unless there's a justification. Um, the, the challenge uh, is, uh, um, you know, in the Linux world at least, and a lot of uh, modern compilers will put a timestamp in a, in a header, you know, a cough header or something like that, makes it extremely hard to uh, compare two builds uh, byte for byte uh, identical. Now, some people will say, well, you eliminate those timestamp bytes and then you can do a byte comparison, you, you're, you, you know, you're good to go. And how reproducible builds help you is if you can, uh, for example, uh, SolarWinds, this is a, how they've publicly said that they've solved uh, part of their issue, how they've mitigated the supply chain attack, is they actually build the Orion product with three different uh, build servers, you know, one in the cloud, one on-prem, one somewhere else. All three build servers have different uh, users and authentication, and they do builds three ways, and then they compare them and see if they're um, identical. Now, this does not eliminate the possibility of somebody exploiting uh, their build, but they've just made it, like, much harder. So you could argue to yourself, uh, well, it's not a, uh, it's not a 100% perfect mitigation. A lot of mitigations, though, are, tend to be uh, like this, in which you can say, hey, I've taken care of this by doing this this way. I have really made it tremendously harder for a bad guy to go do bad stuff. So this is uh, it's pretty good, but it is hard. I, I remember back in the Unix days before, uh, before Linux, when you know, controlling all of the, the different uh, things that went into the build chain, we actually could do um, byte for byte comparison on builds and prove to ourselves that uh, they were identical bit harder now. And some projects like Yocto Project is an example of uh, support reproducible builds, which I think is, uh, um, is, is uh, and, and continue to try and support that. So, so Salsa is a very useful analytic So the to do here on your list is to 
Hey, I, I would suggest, hey, let's take the salsa map, for example, map your, you know, build uh, system against the salsa map, uh, and then uh, highlight, you know, the, pri the higher priority threats and set, set priorities for mitigating these threats and these, these attacks. And uh, uh, I, I have a quote here at the bottom, the build system must be developed and maintained with the same security, integrity, and diligence as the source code and, result, and resultant product itself. So um, uh, I think that's exactly the kind of requirement that, that we will start seeing um, really uh, make itself felt. And I think it should just be a melt baseline mantra that we start um, telling ourselves as we're planning on software projects, as we're staffing them, as we're thinking about the care and diligence we're putting against these things. So the next step, once you've uh, analyzed your, uh, your build system, the next tools we wanna look at is saying, okay, what are some good open source tools to try to um, you know, mitigate some of these threats? And I'm offering some of these things as, uh, um, there, there's, as I, uh, have learned um, a lot of the tools that are being developed and open source projects that are working in this space. There's there's a huge list of people working on uh, various uh, projects to uh, try and address supply chain issues. Um, and, and there's a lot of, that are in active development right now. So um, I wish I could tell you there's a really complete set of things that you can go to start implementing right away. Um, the reality is this is a little bit more of a scientific uh, uh, report to you of, of experimental results that we have so far. Some are, are better than others. Um, so we'll tell you what we've uh, found so far, what we've played with, and, and some of the results so you can make use of them uh, immediately. So the first thing um, I think about in this is let's, let's look at the dependency area. Now, as I've argued uh, plenty of times in various different forums, and you know, I've talked about uh, these different uh, you know, industry groups and collaborations between different companies and various organizations and, and nonprofits and communities. Um, the dependency uh, situation for open source is complicated. And it's complicated because um, there's, there's, there's somewhat of a reputation that open source um, software can sometimes have uh, more security issues than closed source software. Why? Well, I think it's a, there's, there's fear that says, well, if everyone can see the source code, then people can find exploits. And what I've argued is, hey, actually open source software can, ha can be potentially much more secure than proprietary code because you have more eyes you know, on the code and, and uh, able to find the, the bugs and, and, uh, and fix them. Whereas with closed source code, that's not always the case. Um, the usual best practice in the area of cryptography code is if you've got a new crypto protocol, you wanna make sure that the code for that is, is published at least a year before you try and make use of it so that people have a chance to vet it uh, properly. But there can be a problem with dependencies, uh, particularly uh, you know, how do you do, uh, and there's kind of a dilemma is the way I put it. So the thing about dependencies is, do you freeze them or not? And as a software developer, um, probably the fewer things that are gonna move out from under you and, and cause your, uh, your software to break, the better, right? And so there's this kind of strong tendency not to update stuff because um, if you update stuff, man, I gotta go see if there are any bugs that were introduced by that update. Now, not every uh, open source, some open source projects make a, an extremely strong priority not to break any um, any code that depends on it. Not every project is as, as well behaved as that. So um, that's a, a kind of a reality. So if I'm using, uh, I'm maybe writing something in Node.js and I use some uh, code out of NPM, um, what, are, what am I dependent on there? Um, there's a famous example where somebody was, uh, uh, had a, uh, something out of uh, NPM and they had, um, uh, they decided they were gonna pull, pull their code out of NPM. And it was uh, based on some naming dispute or something like that. Anyway, there was all of the software that depended on this extremely popular uh, bit of Node.js code suddenly was just like broken. And if anybody had tried to build at that point, it, they wouldn't have been able to build. And uh, so 
people want to protect against that sort of thing, right? And there's, you know, somebody could maybe subvert one of these open source repos, PyPI or, you know, something else. And so you go, oh, well, let me download the dependencies, let me vet them, and then only build out of my local repo, which is great. However, the dilemma is, what if somebody has discovered a security uh, problem in that code? What if somebody has issued an update that has fixed the security issue uh, or has, uh, you know, at least fixed bugs, right? So this is a uh, this is the dilemma. Do you do you keep your your stuff frozen? Now, I mean, if you're developing against like the tip of the Linux tree or something like that, quite often um, you you will need to rebase your code pretty frequently. I've had engineers try and you know goal to to rebase stuff every week or something like that. Um, uh, but but generally. Uh, what do you do about this? And the suggestion that I have for you is, um, in this case, uh, try to uh, have automated um, uh, CVE checking uh, integrated into your CI system, and try and make sure that you're uh, every time you're, you know, if you do like daily builds or builds every hour or however frequently you're doing it, that you're automatically scanning uh, for uh, security issues, logging the results, and and you know, reviewing them as well to make sure that something hasn't popped up. Um, now, you could spend a bunch of money on a commercial product for this, and we do, uh, we, we, you know, my company, we, we spend money on these tools, but there are also some tools that are free and that are uh, free and open source. Here's an example, the CVN, CVE bin tool. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a big fan of this one because it's um, developed and maintained by uh, uh, an Intel uh, security engineer expert, uh, Dr. Terriota. And so um, she has a, a longer uh, presentation about this that she's uh, given at PyCon before. So uh, I'd highly recommend uh, that you check this out. Now, as opposed to a commercial product that maybe has thousands of open source, you know, projects it can, uh, it can scan against. This one is, you know, has a, a limited number, maybe about 100, but because it's an open source project, people can contribute to this and add the other, you know, libraries that they're concerned with. And it really helps you identify um, the, the surprise dependencies, you know, in, in your code and, uh, uh, and actually queries uh, uh, against a known vulnerability. So, so this is extremely powerful. Best of uh, best best of everything. It's also free and open source, and so uh, it's uh, extremely powerful. So this is one of the to dos I would suggest is is absolutely make make use of this tool because it's extremely helpful. What else can we uh, address um, in terms of this uh, map? I I, I I really think builds are one of those areas we're going to have to just knuckle down and try and do something with, uh, and. Um, you know, even the best architected build can have uh, problems. Uh, uh, you know, if somebody has a, a target directory that's this world writable um, that, that build artifacts are going into. Well, that's not necessarily something you might have documented in a build architecture, but it's something that um, we have to really be thinking about this stuff at a very, uh, um, you know, a very careful level. Now, what are the tools available uh, to us to help achieve a better uh, result in terms of build security? Uh, we've, we've been playing around with Intoto, which is another uh, open source project. When I read about uh, this, uh, I and my uh, other uh, you know, colleagues uh, got very excited about it because it looks like it's just a really great solution to help make sure that um, you know, in, in a lot of different areas that only people authorized to check in code are able to, to, do, um, to do those actions. And the only people able to do builds are authorized users. Um, and as we've gotten and played uh, with this, and we've done some work, um, um, we've had a we've had a bit of challenge. One of them, um, and and how this works is essentially there's a layout that gets defined for the project, and a um, you know all the steps in the supply chain uh, are identified by who can take the steps and um, uses you know public key cryptography to to validate that it's only authorized people are doing those steps, and the result can then be inspected and verified to make sure that. Only authorized people did what they were supposed to do. Um, we've run into a few challenges, and at the state of uh, the project right now, there's there's some additional, um, you know, learning curve that we had when we first started work on this. We said, hey, maybe we can manually uh, create the layout, and uh, we had uh, we had a, a few problems trying to 
um, do that manually. Uh, um, and uh, there are actually some folks that are working on some automatic layout generation tools. So that was, um, uh, but whoever is going to create the layout for uh, the build system uh, for, the, for, for your project does have a learning curve to go up to, to try and address this. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, and, um, you know, the documentation, there is documentation. It's not complete. It's going to be said for a lot of open source projects. Uh, but it's still under development. They're, they're making progress. Uh, and uh, um, this comment that it's based on keys, um, as, as anybody who's uh, done work on, uh, uh, you know, public key cryptography, maybe you use PGP or some other, uh, system like that, um, the system, until you have it working really reliably, um, it can sometimes be challenging that everybody has all the access to the right keys and, and uh, make all the, the stuff go. So that's, that's the based on keys. It's, this is uh, both a challenge as well as a, a good, you know, feature of, of Intoto. Um, the things, though, that are really positive about this and the thing that makes me um, optimistic that it will actually be very uh, helpful is that um, it is it is a very good concept. I think it really thinks through this whole area of how we, you know, secure software builds. Uh, and there are active maintainers that are, you know, willing to get on uh, email and help. Um, and the metadata standard, uh, uh, in the metadata format is a uh, an open standard. So um, with all these things, I, I would say, yeah, Intoto has some, uh, you know, some challenges. There's a there's a learning curve involved, but I, I our, our experimental results. Uh, to date are that um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll continue to uh, work on it and there's some development. Uh, but look, you're going to have to start someplace. And I think this is a really good place to start uh, and, and uh, to, to start opening up the box. Uh, by the way, uh, it's like I, I uh, suggested earlier, um, a lot of people, once they get their build system set up, maybe they've worked super hard to optimize it like crazy and are not really excited about re-architecting the thing. And uh, uh, certainly not right before a, a product release or something like that. Um, but what I would say is this is going to be worth the effort, particularly when um, you have people who are asking questions about, hey, uh, how protected you are against uh, a crook, a criminal, a nation state from uh, getting in and, and uh, violating your stuff. So um, I think it's really worth the, the effort to climb the learning curve uh, and try and uh, address some of these things. So the, in, uh, the to-do here in hardening your build chain, uh, and, and I, I, um, I, you know, first of all, like automating your builds, no, have no human interaction required, um, log and retain everything. Um, it's it's uh, um, true that this stuff takes up uh, disk space, but uh, I, I think this is, uh, there's plenty of storage out there, and, and I think this is uh, important to do. Um, automating dependency checking. Uh, and check the results. Uh, some people I know, for example, when they automate tools like this, they'll go and uh, put in some rule-based thing to basically say, hey, when, when do we want to flag and fail the build? You know, um, is, is there a new CVE that pops up? By the way, the other thing about dependency checking, let me uh, riff on this just a second as well, is that when you think about automated dependency checking, um, you can, uh, uh, it's not just when you have uh, issued, okay, here's my binary that I, I product, right? Um, I think part of it's going to be um, if, if you're supporting that, that thing or giving long-term support of some sort, I think it's going to be important to keep uh, running uh, CVE checking um, to make sure that new CVEs haven't popped up because that may imply that you need to, you know, update the product and fix some of these things. And finally, in Toto, I think is a, a, a terrific concept. Uh, it, it has a little bit of work. Um, but I think this is the best uh, thing that I've seen so far in, in addressing that particular uh, area of securing the, the build infrastructure. Uh, here's, the, here's the summary. Uh, we really, uh, as an open source community, need to take so the supply chain threat seriously. This is something we're going to, we have been asked, and probably uh, if you're attending the conference and, and attending these talks, I think this is something you really need to, to take seriously. Um, my advice is to analyze your setup uh, using Salsa and uh, create a threat model around uh, the way you're building your software. And then, uh, and, and then use, not only using the threat model, but prioritizing the kinds of things you want to address. 
And then we've offered a couple of tools, CVA Bin Tool and Intoto, that are uh, uh, great uh, starting points for a couple of these areas. And uh, there are more that are, are being developed as, as we find more um, things to experiment with and uh, uh, put more uh, you know, methods out there. We'll, we'll certainly be uh, helping um, try and improve this whole area. So um, thank you very much for attending. I appreciate uh, uh, any questions you might have and uh, certainly uh, open to fielding them at this time.